Welcome everyone to panel four, Managing BPD in the Workplace. We're delighted you can join us today. My name is Jillian Papa and I'll be moderating the panel as a volunteer for Emotions Matter. While I'm doing the introductions, we invite you to write in the chat where you're joining from today. Welcome, I'm from Chicago, Illinois. I'm going to spend just a couple moments uh, sharing my screen and going over some uh, community guidelines. So give me one second. Okay, so um, just a quick slide on Emotions Matter. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization founded in 2015 to support and educate and advocate for those impacted by BPD. Our vision is to create a world in which every person with BPD has access to treatment and resources to achieve a meaningful recovery. Um, our philosophy is that we strive to create a safe, judgment-free space for people with BPD. We accept that there is a spectrum of experiences within the community. We honor where people are on their journey without judgment or assumptions. We encourage people to define their own path towards recovery. And we speak as experts of our own lived experience, not as medical experts. Guidelines for uh, our community engagement today. Uh, any questions during the session, you can uh, should be asked using the Q&A box, which is in the top right, and not the chat, ideally. Uh, use respectful language in the chat. Any inappropriate messaging, including harassment, bullying, or monopolizing will be deleted. We accept differences and promote acceptance. Avoid explicit expressions of self-harm or trauma. Panel and plenary sessions will be recorded and available after the conference. Please no screenshots or recording on personal devices. Lastly, here's our safety guidelines disclaimer. Most importantly, please take care of yourself at any time during this fest. You find yourself overwhelmed, struggling, or in need of support. We encourage you to reach out to your support system. Audience members, you know, you might experience some intense or painful emotions, feelings, memories, you know, any of that and could be triggering from the content shared. So participate at your own risk. And you're welcome to take a break from the fest at any time or withdraw from it entirely. In the event of a medical emergency, including mental health, please seek care through a doctor, hospital, or emergency call number, such as 911 in the US. Okay, let me stop sharing my screen. Okay, so as a reminder, this is panel four, managing BPD in the workplace. So this session will explore challenges and solutions that may come up for individuals with BPD who are seeking employment, maintaining employment, communicating with employers, coworkers, advocating for recovery needs in workplace settings. The format of this presentation um, will include Dr. Sarah Feinberg keep kicking us off followed by a couple rounds of mini stories shared by panelists of lived experience in their personal workplace journey. At this time, I'll introduce Dr. Sarah Feinberg. She is a psychiatrist at Yale University who works in an outpatient clinic and directs a clinical research lab focused on understanding BPD experiences and treatment. She is proud to be an Emotions Matter board member for the past three years. Her favorite food is green peas and this spring she is growing them in her new garden. Very cool. So now I'm gonna pass the mic to our amazing panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, the order that we'll go in today will be Gracie, Jennifer, Maria. So if you guys like to introduce yourselves and then we can do that round robin um, story sharing. Hi everyone, I'm Gracie. Um, I'm a volunteer for Emotions Matter uh, and a group facilitator. Um, I am in Colorado and um, happy to be doing my second panel for them. Hi, I'm Jennifer and I'm from New York City. I'm also a brand new volunteer for Emotions Matter. Um, and um, this is my second panel today and i um, happy to be here. Maria, um, I'm from Queens, New York. Um, I'm a volunteer with Emotions Matter. This is my second time doing a panel. I'm really excited to be here and be part of the awareness for BPD. 
Great. And then I, I, I think I may have misspoke. Let's have Sarah say a few words and then we'll do, we'll start our round robin if that's okay. All right. Great. Um, thanks for the introductions, everyone. I'm really glad to be here today and to get to be part of the panel with everyone. Um, so I think that uh, the comments I wanted to make uh, are about what we know about um, the contribution of work to recovery. And I think the the big answer is we, we know a lot from lived experience, and that's what we're going to hear about today. And we know not enough from research. And so, you know, I hope that one of the things that might come out of this conversation is what... Um, what kinds of questions researchers should be asking, you know, and also um, what lived experience stories we can get out there to help other people have ideas about um, work and, and where and when it fits into the recovery journey. So I did want to talk, though, about work in the broader context of valued roles. And I think that one really useful thing that work can offer is an opportunity to find a valued role among a group of other people, both to find a role that feels satisfying to oneself and sort of fits with your own sense of yourself and to sort of develop a more stable sense of self over time, and also to get feedback from other people that they are valuing your contribution. And that's something we really have leaned in on at Emotions Matter. And I'm proud of my role here. And I feel better after coming and contributing to the community. And I think that's something that, that I share with the other panelists here is that we're here today because it's important to us to be, to be contributing. And, you know, I think that what we're going to hear about today is the ways in which sometimes work can be challenging in terms of getting the kinds of feedback that help you feel valued. And then we're going to hear, I think, about some ideas about how to engage with work in ways that can increase the likelihood of feeling valued and being valued. And, you know, there is some research that suggests that participating in work and other valued roles like being a volunteer or contributing to the people you care about can be really helpful in terms of likelihood to, of getting to a place where you feel better over time. Um, some people would call that recovery. And, you know, some of the kinds of questions that we're asking now are, if you are a person with BPD in full-time work, what is that like? What is What are the things that, and how does it change over time? We'd like to know when you're a person with BPD who uses work and other strategies to achieve various aspects of recovery. How does your subjective experience, the way you feel and the way you talk about it change? And also, how do aspects of your brain and behavior change? One area of a lot of interest in my research lab is how do people's behaviors change in ways that we might be able to target if we knew what it looks like in the brain of someone who's already recovered? Could we somehow identify brain regions or behavioral aspects and try to help people get to those things faster. Uh, current strategies for BPD are helpful, but they're not helpful to enough people and they don't work fast enough. People, people often go a long time before anyone admits to them that they have BPD. And then people work really hard in the available treatments for far too long before they get enough relief. And so I think that the medical community and the psychology community should be joining with people with BPD to try to do better, because I'm not sure that we're meeting people in the middle. So I think work is one place where um, people are going out and, and figuring stuff out. And it can be a sort of a laboratory to get to try things and to get to see how it works and to try things out. So I'm really eager to hear if these ideas resonate with the panelists and their stories and then for us to talk together today. So uh, that that's what I want to say at the beginning. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Gracie, would you like to kick us off? Sure. Um, I guess one of the biggest tips that I can give that I've found through my experience is just overall finding a good fit for me in the workforce. Um, I tried food and bath for so many years. And after crying in the walk-ins and, you know, all the no call uh, no call, no shows, you know, it's not a good fit for me. It's too high paced. It's too high anxiety. There's too many variations of people when people have such a big impact on what can make or break my day. Um, 
So finding a job, like currently we're, you know, some of it's people facing, some of it's just being able to work behind a desk and do what I'm good at. That's always been something that's a good fit for me, as well as stuff that I can find my identity in. Um, because my sense of identity is always shifting. So finding that sense of purpose and, you know, when I worked in a rehab and I felt like I was helping people and working with the homeless population. Um, And then now, even though I don't really have like that aspect, just to feel the sense of success that comes along with, I'm working a full-time job that I never thought I could. um, That's been the biggest thing for me. Thank you, Gracie. Um, So I agree with Dr. Feinberg and yourself. I think work is a big part of my identity. Um, It provides structure to my day. I'm one of those people that do really poorly if I don't have structure, you know, making me get up and, 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 you know, get myself, you know, showered and eating breakfast and things like that. So work is really important. But having said that, um, and and I'm lucky that I actually found a position, a, 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 a career that I enjoy. I'm a data analyst. And it gives me the right combination of sitting in front of my computer, just focused on doing my own thing and, you know, to the exclusion of everything else. But also, you know, being able to work in a team, Uh, I work with with a team of like a few other people. um, So there's there's a good combination of that. Um, Unfortunately, um, you know, I'm, you know, they they sometimes say that folks with BPT have trouble, um, you know, keeping a job. I don't have that trouble. I'm, you know, I, I'm one of those people where I go into a job, I give it up my all, and I'm able to hide my symptoms, you know, and I, I completely shut down anything that's BPD or my emotions or anything, and I just, you know, I'm like the robot employee sort of. So, you know, there, there's a challenge in being what's considered high functioning. And having to maintain that image all the time, like 24 seven when you're at work, and then you feel like when you're not having a good day, um, what do you do? You know, like, am I an imposter? You know, am I really who people think I am? And there comes a lot of the sense that I'm, I'm, I'm like fake or I'm a fraud or something. So, um, you know, a bad day for me, you know, like when I'm good, I'm like really great and people love me and, you know, people say I'm a great employee, whatever. And when I'm bad, like, you know, on those really difficult days, I can barely get out of bed and I have physical symptoms. I can't get out of the bathroom. You know, I, you know, it's just a, a lot of difficulty. And what I found what really helps me um, is having a buddy system, having just one person at work. It doesn't even have to be a close friend or anybody, but somebody who's squarely on your side, on your team that you can like text in the morning and say, hey, um, I'm running late. I'm, you know you know, having gastrointestinal problems, whatever, or anxiety. Um, Can you cover for me this morning? And I'll pop in when I can. And just letting somebody know that, you know, you are a human being, you have challenges, you have a life outside of work. And maybe that life includes, you know, some anxiety or some depression or I I never mentioned BBD. Nobody knows that I have borderline personality disorder. Um, But having just one person who can have my back and uh, support me, I find that makes a world of difference. Um, So that's my biggest tip for how to get through those really, really difficult days. And I don't recommend turning off your phone and ignoring the emails and just going MIA because that just makes everybody worry. So, you know, if you have that one person that can cover for you and maybe just tell everybody else that you're running late or you're homesick today, um, that, that helps me. Yeah, I just want to echo what um, Jennifer and Gracie have talked about. Um, you know, I think for me, the biggest challenge with work has been the interpersonal relationships of like team members and with my boss, right? And so what I started to do in my career was I started off with like smaller roles that didn't have as much pressure to them. And I really made it a purpose to really start to understand what are the interpersonal like conflicts I'm having, what could come up. Um And one of the things I did do was that I started to disclose to my manager. Like I was, I assessed to kind of see after a little while, like, was this manager or someone that I could, you know, disclose and maybe get support from. But when I did that, I also waited a bit because I wanted to kind of figure out how is my BPD affecting me at work and what does that look like? And then um, I went and had a conversation with my supervisor and said, hey, you know, like I have BPD, but I also used it as an opportunity to educate her and kind of say, hey, this is how it's affecting me at my job. How could we do this? 
Um, I and I asked her, what are some of the areas you think that I'm it's affecting and at work? It's very helpful and forth. Like brought it back to therapy and like I would on things at work and bring it back to therapy and be like, you know, I, I kind of social like a social cue like coach kind of at work with another department to kind of actually I'm not like I miss I misread them. And then as a result of that, you know, like spiraling, right? But I think that through my career, it got better. Slowly got better. I had to identify, okay, these are vulnerabilities to a new role, especially interpersonal relationships. And I was able to cope ahead with my um, and now I'm in a position now where it's a lot more pressure, but I can handle it because of all the practice I've had in other positions and being intentional with it, right? Um, and so, you know, I the intro challenges were the hardest part for me and just, you know, and it wasn't easy to recognize. I didn't really want to admit that I, I had this struggle, but I was like, I don't really know how people feel about me. I want to know how they feel about me. And if not my whole day shot, it's, it's like this, this like constant merry-go-round and, um, you know, through, you know, having a buddy at work, like Jennifer was talking about someone, I usually did it from someone that was in a different department just because it helped to kind of like offset it being from your own team. And it, this was someone that, you know, I could be honest with about my BPD. Wasn't a therapist, but if there was like an, a conflict, I would go to them and say, hey, like, this is what happened. What is your perspective? Um, so yeah, that's that was one of my tips. Yeah, I really, I really resonate with what both of you were saying. Jennifer, I'm so glad that you were able to verbalize what I've never quite been able to about um, feeling the imposter syndrome from being like, quote unquote, high functioning person with BPD. Because people tell me that all the time. They're like, well, you seem stable. And I'm like, well, yeah, but like, <laughs> but I think um, another huge thing with what you guys are talking about with having almost that buddy system is like, just the support system in general. Like I was so lucky at my last job, the program director at the rehab became one of my best friends and it was almost like free therapy. Um, but from, you know, someone that was, you know, in the hierarchy of work um, and could always just tell like, do you need to go for a walk? Do you need to excuse yourself and just sit in your car? You know, um, do you need to take your camera off? Like, on the on the really worst days he would just say go home we got it you know and just being able to have someone like that especially someone that I could be completely transparent with um which was really lucky because in an environment like that when you're working with therapists um how transparent you can be um because in you know contrast working my job now I am a lot more um, hesitant to tell them about my mental health because there's much less understanding in real estate development. Um, but at the same time, my boss, she's still like empathetic enough. She doesn't know what they're for, but she lets me go to eight appointments a week. You know what I mean? Um, she lets me have those telemeds. She makes sure I'm make sure I'm out of the office by four thirty every day so I can make TMS. Um, and so having that instead of someone that makes me feel bad about you know, taking time off or anything like that um, has been has been really good, as well as just having, you know, a coworker that I can sit down with if I need to just blow off steam or something like that, not feeling like I need to just like hold all my emotions in. Thank you, Gracie. Um, so the other thing that's challenging about being in the workplace with BPD is um, I noticed that um, one of my worst um, symptoms that I, that, um, that challenges me with BPD is my black and white thinking. So either I do a perfect job or I'm terrible, I'm horrible and everybody hates me. Um, and I, I, if it forces me to confront that symptom every day, the black and white thinking, um, you know, because you're always going to be working on something where it's never going to, it's not going to be perfect. Um, but you have to honor your ability, what your capacity is, what your capabilities are, and also honor your limits. So these days, I don't know how it is for everybody, but in my job, people are leaving. <laughs> we're, having, we're having difficulty rehiring people and everyone's being asked to do more and more work. So for me, um, I think it's important to honor your capabilities and your, your limits 
and be able to, what I'm learning is how to practice effective communication skills. So, you know, people ask me to do things and I'm the kind of person I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll do it, you know, because I want to help out or whatever. And that's just who I am. But I, it, that also stresses me out and it makes me not able to do my own work. And then my black and white thinking kicks in and then every, all of a sudden everything's horrible. So, you know, being able to effectively say to whoever's making the request, you know, no, I can't do that right now. Or this is somebody else um, who, who can help you or maybe even asking for help because asking for help, um, and that's one of the themes of this conference being you know, advocacy, um, not just ad advocacy in an organizational level, but being able to advocate for your own needs. Um, one of my difficulties is you know, acknowledging when I need help um, and, um, and when I'm not able to get something done and when I need more resources you know, available to me. So that's something that I've learned in the past two years, um, how to tell people that I'm not able to, you know, you know, finish something on time or that I need help from somebody in a different department or, you know, something like that, or, or that I'm not able to handle any more extra work. So, you know, just, I guess, just really knowing your own limits, um, honoring your, your limits and capabilities, being able to effectively advocate for yourself and communicating, you know, to other people um, is it, really important and also basic self-care, just taking care of yourself. I want to echo what um, Jennifer and Gracie have already said. You know, I think for me, you know, one of the biggest things as, you know, as I'm going into a new position is it's really important for me to have a conversation with my manager about work-life balance because that's pivotal for me, right? Like I cannot work a job that's 70 hours a week. I'm not available after five. Like I need to be able to maintain that balance for my mental health. Um, I think the other thing is that, you know, before I – take a new job or if I'm interviewing for a new job, one of the things I do is I actually talk to the team members. Like, you know, you'll have a group interview, but then I'll ask for a separate conversation to kind of have a conversation with them about how do we partner? How do we work together? What is the communication like with the team itself, right? And people are usually very honest and that has helped me to kept me out of some very toxic work environments. And sometimes you just don't know, but I think also asking questions, um, you know, they'll also, they'll tell you about their experience at work and, you know, what it's like. And then you kind of get a sense from them about it. Um, and I think that's really, really important because the manager that you have is like, is like pivotal. And I'm sure we all know this, but I think also asking him about what is his communication like with like, what is his style? Cause I want to make sure my style matches up with his, you know what I mean? Like if you're someone that is a micromanager, if you're someone that's going to be on me consistently, like that's, that's going to create stress for me. So kind of assessing that stuff ahead of time and being able to do that is really important. I think one of the other useful tools that I used at work, which was really helpful was that getting to know the people that I'm in, I'm going to have the most communication with on my team. Like I just, and what I found is that when I get to know people better, it makes it, like, if there's a conflict, it makes it a lot easier to talk about it. Now, sometimes I'd be like, I don't want to do that. Cause they don't, they're not going to talk to me. Like, who am I? But I was like, I, I did a dear man with them. I talked about it with my therapist. I role played with her. Right. Um, because that was also part of my job was being able to do that. And I can, I can say now after being in several positions, you know, in my first position with the boss, I was talking about that was, um, that I had disclosed to my, I was crying, I would say like at least once or twice a week because of interactions that I was having with people. And that was probably about, I want to say, I mean, like about six years ago, you know, and now I'm in a place where, you know, I, I feel like I can manage my emotions better at work. I'm not going to hide who I am, but I know how to, how to manage it better. So I don't get triggered as much. And if I do, I kind of have it like, it's, I kind of get a sense of what it is. Um, and I'm able to then address it, but it took a lot of time. It took time for me to get to where I am now and, and feel like I'm in a place where I can be successful at work and show up and do the work and, and you know, and, and also be authentic to my needs and, and what's important. I love that you said that because that was a great segue into what I was going to talk about. It was just like my coping skills as a whole, just evolving over time. I'm so glad that my parents are here because they know more than everyone. Like I can... I very easily get jobs and then it's very hard for me to hold jobs because I just didn't have any coping skills. Like how many times I just rage quit or, you know, I was so depressed I couldn't get out of bed. So I was like, I'm just going to quit. I'll just find another job. Like that's kind of where my mind was. I would get so angry or so depressed. I just quit. I'll just find another one. 
um, because I just didn't have any type of coping skills. And um, now, you know, between DBT stuff, um, with addressing the black and white thinking that Jennifer was talking about and addressing like my perfectionism with all of that has been a lot as well as um, a lot of the things I've learned in the 12 step community of being in recovery. Um, so when I'm really angry at someone else or a situation, like what was my part in it? What did it bring out of me emotionally? Um, how do I, you know, prevent that from happening in the future? Um, the times where I just need to ride out the emotion and just keep quiet until I'm in a place that I can, you know, finally respond. Um, because for me, you know, I've always struggled with a, my emotional response to things and then b what I like to call like my meta emotional response, my response to my emotional reaction. Like did, am I ashamed of how I reacted in that situation? And am I judging myself for how I reacted in that situation? Was it appropriate? Was it to the right um, degree? You know, am I crazy? This is why I shouldn't be, you know, working, whatever it is. And I think, you know, it's really great to have been able to find resources like DBT, like 12 step programs, like emotions matter, and to kind of like, just really bolster this skill set that actually allows me to be, you know, a somewhat productive member of society. Um, and that makes me just feel more confident about myself. Um, like for instance, in sort of talking myself down on Thursday, it was one of those, like if something wrong could go, could happen, like it was going to happen. It was just one thing after another. And I was so proud of myself because like the catering was messed up, you know? And usually it would be, oh my gosh, like I'm the worst. Everyone in the office is gonna hate me. This is something, of course, this is something I would do. That's what I get for like having responsibilities, you know, in this whole spiral. And instead, you know, I took a second and I turned it around and was like, this isn't in my control. I don't have the power to make the catering people do their job. Um, and just kind of like, reframing my whole mindset around it um, to be able to just like better bolster my reactions to things. That's very, very well said. I think a lot of managing DPD in the workplace has to do with our mindset and, 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 and um, you know, just maintaining um, an attitude that's being patient with ourselves. Um, because we're really judgmental and hard on ourselves, all of us. <laughs> um, so one thing I learned, um, and this is not just about workplace, but I learned this really young, I mean, ever since I was in school, um, I have a problem with procrastinating, not starting projects or avoiding things like, oh, this thing I have to do, I have to respond to this person, I'll do it later, I'll do something else first. Um, so I will procrastinate on major projects or you know, avoid certain people or certain things that I should be doing and I don't do it. And, and that's not a BPD thing. That's just, you know, a normal, you know, workplace um, uh, thing that people have to manage. But the way BPD makes it harder is that, you know, because it could go into my negative thinking and I could spiral and I can think, you know, I'm not good at this job. I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm, you know, so one thing, and I'm going to pitch a, a kind of a strange idea. Um, so you know how we all make lists, people say make lists, um, you know, break it down to chunks, you know, cross off, you know, you know, certain things or prioritize whatever. I found that I'm very good at making lists, you know, a little bit of OCD, whatever, but then staring at a list of like 20 things I have to do, or even just, you know, trying to figure out the one or two things I have to do out of that list of 20 things just made me depressed. <laughs> like I didn't, like I wasn't doing enough. So then I did the opposite thing where I would start with a blank sheet. And on those really bad days, I actually wrote down everything I did do that day. <laughs> I opened my email. I responded to this person. I, you know, whatever. And I've seen that list grow. It, it's kind of, it's kind of silly, but actually um, because, you know, my OCD behavior likes making lists, it became a little bit of a game for me to see, you know, okay, now I did this now I can do something else. So it's kind of a backwards approach to, you know, list making was to um, just write down all the things that I did, that, did do, no matter how small. And that kind of gave me the confidence and motivation to keep going because a lot of time it's just starting, you know, just getting started. So that's my, uh, that's my tip. 
I just want to echo what Gracie and um, Jennifer have shared. You know, I think for me, there were so many years that I was so ashamed of having BPD and, and because of, I was experiencing interpersonal relationships at work. I was like, why am I having all these issues? This is just like, I just, I, I beat myself up so hard for it. And I really carried that into the workplace with me. Um, but, you know, I think I also, I found support inside of work and also outside of work, right? 12 step, a 12 step community is also part of my journey. Um, and having, I had like a mini board of directors of, of individuals in my life, probably like three people that see blind spots that I don't see, right? So they're kind of like my perspective, right? They help me to shift perspective. They help me to kind of see things in a different way. And I need that. I need that in my life because without it, you know, the biggest thing about me going to a 12 step meeting is I get to hear about other people's pain and I get to get perspective. And so for, for me with someone with BPD, getting perspective puts, it really helps a lot. Because then it puts into perspective, like, what am I, what's the story I'm creating versus what's reality, right? And that really helps, right? Because I, I spent, I, I still do, I spend time like creating an illusion of what I think is going on and it doesn't really make any sense, but it's part of my black and white thinking. And then I'm like, wait, like, but this is a reality. You know what I mean? Like reality is, is, you know, I'm learning to live life on life's terms. And um, I think also, you know, you what I learned about also working in the workplace is that we're amazing. You know, being, being, having BPD gives us an advantage in the sense of empathy, in the sense of seeing things, seeing the world in a way that other people don't see it because of what we've been through. And you bring that perspective with you to work. And that's, and that's something that is highly valued. So that, that's one thing that I would say. Well said. Well said. I think we just did our three rounds. I did want to just, um, Sarah, is there anything you want to say about anything that was said? Um, you know, just want to I just, you. I just to say that I think, I think these perspectives are so helpful. And I think that, um, I, I just would say, um, I, I think that these stories are so, articulate and clear and specific. And I really appreciated the, the description uh, that, that Maria and, and Jennifer and Gracie each gave of the ways that knowing yourself better over time, you can actually make these, these things that, that were previously difficulties actually into strength and sort of leverage them. And I think I, I heard especially about the reverse list making. I'll say, Jennifer, I also do that. And I, I really benefit from it. I think I dig that idea. And um, and also, Maria, what you were just saying about like valuing the ways in which you're socially perceptive. And I, I think that makes so much sense. And I think Gracie was talking about really from the very beginning of this session, like paying attention to the things that you are good at and putting yourself in a position to succeed. And I think like, I just, I, I come away from this sort of inspired and with new language to talk about, um, talk about these ideas. So I just, I just want to like really sort of give a big cheer to these, to these panelists. Um, so there's a question in the, in the Q and A, and I didn't know if any of us could could help with that or if or if there were more ideas from from the audience or from ed if if you wanted to say something more about this this question about cultural insights to highlight yeah so if you panelists if you look on the top right hand uh corner of the screen under q a you'll see the question i can read it out loud um, does anyone have any cultural insights to highlight? For example, could anyone contrast working in an American corporate culture versus somewhere international, Mexican, British, Canadian? I know we're all in the U.S., so we may not um, have any comments on that, but just seeing if anyone does. I can answer. I just started working in a corporate company. Um, I can't speak for other, you know, how other countries are doing, but in corporate culture, things are very structured which is really helpful for someone with BPD because it really helps me to be very clear about what are my responsibilities? What do I have to do? Um, and it also is very, the, what I'm, what I'm finding is that it's also very, um, it's not vague. And so the structure really allows you to kind of take the emotion out of things so that you're very clear on what you have to do. Um, and I think the level of professionalism that I'm experiencing in corporate culture is different than what I've experienced in other organizations. 
Yeah, I can kind of um, piggyback off of that, Maria, more so in like the workplace culture and stuff. Because like I said, you know, I've worked in behavioral health where it's very okay to address your feelings. And I've worked in jobs where it's like, leave it at the door, you know, which is kind of like, yes. And, you know, I can't come in here being a mess, but, you know, to just people with BPD don't really have the advantage of turning that off like some other people do. Um, And so I think that's a really big cultural difference between, between some of the places that I've been in and why the places where it was so much, you know, leave it at the door just wasn't a good fit for me. Um, Not being able to feel like I have anyone to talk to or be able to address. And that's kind of when, I self-destruct eventually. Yes, thank you for sharing that. Um, We've received a couple more questions in the chat. Um, One I think is really interesting, which is, is there any suggestions for disclosing to coworkers and supervisors? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I can speak to that. So when I start a new job, I wait to kind of see, like I said earlier about, um, is this someone that if I give this information to, they're going to be curious about it and they're going to be supportive or are they going to be how are like, in other words, how are they, how are they going to handle the information I'm going to give them? Right. Um, and I always bring it back to, you know, if, if I, if I do have a supervisor that's a little bit like emotionally dry, what I basically say to them is look, you know, I currently have BPD and so it affects my, it, it I want to improve. And so here are some of the ways that, that I do do that. And this is how I think it may be affecting my performance um, and so I wanted to talk to you about strategies of what of what I could do to help improve this and make this part of our like development plan. I think as far as coworkers, one of the things that I do, I'm careful about with coworkers because one of the things I'm thinking about is how are they going to use this information and why am I telling them in the first place, right? Like what's the purpose behind it? Um, because I've had some coworkers that were really toxic and some coworkers that were great, right? But kind of like, being very discerning and selecting, well, what are they going to do with this information? What's the purpose of me telling them? So, yeah, I spoke a little bit about that. I'm sorry, I'm crazy. <laughs> no, go ahead. Um, it, it really depends on the work environment and your coworkers and your supervisor and your management. I happen to have, and, and I haven't always had this, but I happen to have a supervisor that acts in a more of a mentor role. And because of that, I, I, I don't tell anybody I have BPD. Nobody at work knows that I have that, but they do know that um, I, you know, may have anxiety problems or, you know, I suffer from depression. Um, but, you know, when I'm having a hard time, I can't always hide it, especially when I can't, you know, get my work done. And then I would have to talk to my boss, uh, my supervisor, but he he's a little bit of a mentor to me. So his, he, because I feel like he wants me to succeed, I feel more comfortable in letting him know, you know, I need to take a, a day off, you know, because I need to deal with some stuff. And he doesn't ask questions, you know. I think that's like an HR thing, at least in, in the U.S., that you, you know, if you take a personal day, they don't have to ask you what you're dealing with. Um, and also, I can get some flexibility, like if I need to go to my medical appointment or something. Um, there, there is some disclosure that you might have to make, but they don't have to know the details, you know, just that you're, you're, you may be struggling with something and everybody knows somebody who's struggling with something. So, you know, um, if we're all part of the same team, you know, um, they'll, they'll help you with it, I hope. <laughs> and, and also the buddy system, you know, just find that one person who can be your buddy, not, not supervisor level. Yeah, like both of you said, kind of the intention behind it, because a lot of it for me, it's, and it's so hard to really wrap my head around even what my intention is, because I don't want to make excuses and I don't want people to pity me. I want people to understand me. Mm-hmm. And it is hard when you are high functioning because you almost want to put it out there because, okay, maybe I'm not acting this way right now, but when it does ultimately come up, I want you to go ahead and be aware instead of me backtracking and saying like, oh yeah, I did all that because of X, Y, and Z. Um, But again, it's just, it's kind of a thing that I'm still dealing with and working with. And I think in the same way of not fully disclosing uh, BPD to my current workplace because I almost feel like I'm still, you know, um, stigmatizing it. And the fact that I 
don't want to tell them because I don't want them to have prior thoughts about what that is and what that means. Mm -hmm. Um, So like I've gone to TMS every single day after work for the past five weeks now. And people know that and people know I'm always at doctor's appointments. And all I say is uh, I have chronic fatigue, you know, and, um, and, you know, I have mental health struggles and so, you know, I go back and forth about that and like, am I stigmatizing this? Like, am I, you know, somehow ashamed of this? But I think it's also just being realistic to the fact that like, this isn't a well-known thing, you know, it, it gets what 10% of the funding is, is other mental uh, health disorders. And so I can't expect other people to understand what that is and what that means for me and how that's going to present. Um, but it's just a lot of things that, you know, I have to be introspective of and then that I have to kind of be, I guess, realistic and, and mature about, you know, telling other people that I think would be able to really handle and understand it. Thank you. So I know we've got two minutes left. Um, I have a couple of remote, uh, closing remarks. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, but if you have an individual question that wasn't answered, um, you can connect with the presenters in their profiles. There's an engage button there. Um, you can also email info at emotionsmatterbpd.org. So on behalf of Motions Matter, I just want to thank the panelists for sharing um, for just this incredibly insightful discussion for me. And I hope for all of you, thank you to the in- attendees for the questions that have been posed. Um, there potentially are some resources. Um, if you were to find those, uh, these downloadable links, you should be able to find them within the session off of the main page. Uh, and then lastly, um, we invite you to make a donation to support Emotions Matter for BPD Awareness Month. We offer these programs for free thanks to your support. Additionally, if you're in New York, um, come to the walk for BPD on June June 5th. And even if you're not, you can walk virtually. Uh, And so you can find all of that good stuff on our website, emotionsmatterbpd.org. So thank you everyone today. Thank you to our panelists and enjoy the rest of the conference.